before a tribulation is heretical. We're going to begin a series on manifest in which we're going to go into detail, and I mean minute biblical detail, examining the rapture theory, especially as it relates to what we call the pre-tribulation return of Jesus for the church. Ladies and gentlemen, of all the programs you've ever seen on manifest, I implore you not to miss the next several weeks. We're going to dig very, very deep in God's Word. Let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus make a statement that two would be grinding at the mill and one would be taken and the other left? Why did he say, keep our lamps trimmed and burning, referring to the ancient oil lamp in which oil was placed in the top and a wick was at the end of it? And you had to keep that oil fresh in that lamp in order to ensure that you would have light even at night? Why did Jesus make those statements? Well, on Manifest, we're going to get into a very, very deep study of God's Word. Now, the first thing I want to share with you is where is it found in the New Testament that there is a revelation of Christ returning for the saints and <clears throat> the dead will be raised and those who are alive will be changed in a moment and caught up to meet Him? The answer, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. Let's read this right now. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now this is when the Mashiach, or the Messiah, Jesus Christ, returns in the atmosphere to raise the dead in Christ, and then after the dead in Christ are raised, those of us who are living, 1 Corinthians 15, are changed in a moment. Metamorpho, changed from one condition to another, one state to another, and then we are caught up to meet them, meaning Christ, and the dead who have been raised, in the air, and so shall the Bible said we ever be with the Lord. Now, let me share something with you. The concept of the Messiah is not revealed just in the New Testament, but the concept of the Messiah is actually revealed in what we call the Old Testament or the First Covenant. It begins in Genesis 3.15. The Lord predicts that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. We discover in Genesis chapter 49 where the old patriarch Jacob is giving a prophecy that in which he says in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. He said a scepter shall arise in Israel. And the word scepter there is a what we call a Hebrew idiom meaning the Messiah. Then it says the scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes. Once again, Genesis 49.10, the Hebrew word uh, Shiloh, uh, Shiloh there is a what a, a title, according to uh, rabbinical scholars and even Christian scholars, for the future Messiah. Now, the word Messiah is found in Daniel chapter 9, 25 through 28, and it's mentioned two times. Uh, the Messiah, the Prince. The Hebrew word there is Mashiach, and it is where it actually means the anointed one, the one who is anointed, the anointed one. Now, that's in the Old Testament. When you come into the New Testament, there is a word called Christos, in the Greek, which again is the word for Christ, translated as Christ in the English translation of the Bible. This word Christos also means anointed one. So when you say Jesus Christ, you're saying uh, Yeshua in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach, or Jesus Yeshua the Messiah. And so we, we understand something here that the concept of a Messiah coming is a Old Testament revelation. It was revealed to the prophets of the Old Testament. Now when we come into the New Testament, we see where Jesus identifies himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a phrase which is found in the book of Daniel where it talks about the Son of Man sitting with the Ancient of Days. So Jesus uses that term, Son of Man, not to say he is just a man, but to identify with the term which is found in the book of Daniel. Now, when we come into the time of Jesus, we discover that he reveals, and the New Testament starts revealing very early, that there will be an ascension of Christ, but also a return of Christ to earth to take the living saints in the air and also to resurrect the dead. Some of the verses are John chapter 14, 1 through 2. 
He said, he said, if I go away, Christ said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. In John chapter 5, verse 28, those in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. John 6, 40. Everyone who believes on the Son, Jesus said, I will raise him up on the last day. In Acts 1, verse 11, the two men in white apparel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Now, the point I wish to make here is these four scriptures definitely reveal that Jesus Christ is going to return again. Now, the, there is a revelation, however, later on in the New Testament of what we call the gathering together. Now, the, the, the Gospels and the book of Acts reveals he will return. But what is interesting is when you come uh, after Pentecost and you come to the time when the Gentiles are grafted into the the covenant in Acts chapter 10, we discover something has happened. There was a man named Saul of Tarsus. We now know him as the Apostle Paul. And Saul of Tarsus, according to his own testimony, after his conversion on the road to Damascus, he went into Arabia. Arabia is where Mount Sinai is located. You'll find that in the book of Galatians. And there he said he received the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. While the Apostle Paul was in Arabia, the Gentiles were being grafted into the new covenant as Peter was preaching in Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10. So the Gentiles enter into the covenant, Acts 10, 11, and 12. And while that is going on, Paul is in Arabia getting a revelation that the Lord would descend from heaven with a shout, and we who are alive and remain would be caught up together in them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul calls this entire incident of the future that's going to happen a mystery. Now, according to scholars, Paul Rick wrote about seven different mysteries in the New Testament, and one of the mysteries is the return of the Lord to resurrect the dead in Christ and the return of the Lord to catch away the living. So this revelation was given to the Apostle Paul. And I've often said this, it is interesting that when you uh, look at the New Testament, it is not put in order. I used to think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written, and then Romans was, Acts was written, and then the book of Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, and it was in order. It is not in order. If you were to put the Bible in order, you would have to put uh, the four Gospels, and you would have to put 1 Thessalonians as the first letter Paul wrote, and 2 Timothy as the last of the 14 letters that Paul wrote. Now, this is why this is important. When Paul came off of the mountain of Arabia in the book of Galatians, and he spent substantial time there, uh, it actually could have been... Uh it actually could have been uh, uh, longer than a year up to three years, according to the book of Galatians. When Paul returned from the mountain of Arabia, he writes the Thess church at Thessalonica in Greece. And he writes 1 Thessalonians. And do you realize <clears throat> that in chapter 1, he mentions the return of the Lord. Chapter 2, the return of the Lord. Chapter 3, the return of the Lord. <clears throat> chapter 4, the return of the Lord. Chapter 5, he mentions the return of the Lord. Chapter 4 is where we get the great revelation of how the Lord will return to catch up the living saints, to catch us up in the air. Now, when I began to read that verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17, I use a word that is found in our English language, and it is the word rapture. Now, I want everybody to clean your ears out and listen to me for just a moment as I share this with you. We receive a lot of emails and letters because of the manifest telecast. Obviously, it's aired around the world on many of the great Christian networks and on satellite. Nothing stirs people up more, and I'm telling you the truth, than when I say rapture. Listen, you have, you have uh, Christians who become more angry by me using that word than if I were to deny that Jesus is the Son of God. They could put up with me more saying that, which I'm not denying Jesus is the Son of God. But I'm saying, you just can't believe. Suddenly you're a heretic. Suddenly you're leading people to hell. Suddenly you're preaching false doctrine that's going to damn the soul because you believe in a word called the rapture. Now, I'm going to be dealing with, on a later program, where that word originated, and I'm going to give you biblically several other words to identify the same event that Paul talked about where we're going to be caught up. I'm going to identify with some words that you can use in place of the word rapture that are more Bible-based word, words instead of an English theological word to describe the event. Now, here's what I want to do.
I want them to put on the screen four references, and I want you to look at the key word because we're going to get into a deep study right here. Four New Testament scriptures that I want to show you, all right? The first reference is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Notice the phrase caught up together. The word caught up means to seize or to pluck by force. That's what the Greek word means we'll talk about in a moment. In Ephesians 1, verse 10, the, the Apostle Paul talked about we will be gathered together in one, and that word there, gathered together in one, is a Greek word that means to sum up together in one. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1, please notice the phrase I'm going to show you, gathering together. The phrase in English, gathering together, which in Greek means a complete collecting of, of something, of individuals. Hebrews 12, 22, and 24. Now listen, when we get to this word, you are going to hear something that is absolutely phenomenal that uh, we've been researching. I want you to look at the word general assembly in the English translation, and it means to assemble all. Now let's right now look at these individual verses. They're going to come up on the screen, four verses that specifically deal with the return of Christ for the saints, or the return of Christ for the saints and the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Here we go. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be, here's the phrase, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This word caught up in Greek is the Greek word harpazo, and it means to seize by force or to pluck up by force. Charlotte, North Carolina years ago, there was a man that owns a great restaurant there. His name is Dino. Was, I, I preached a four-week revival. We ate there, I think, every day because I love that Greek-Italian type food. In fact, I had clams in... Uh, in uh, Clams with spaghetti sauce, the white sauce. And I'm telling you, I smelt like garlic. And when I preached that night and prayed with people, I, I never understood why people kept backing away from me. No, I'm just kidding. But I did eat that. Dino is from Greece. And I asked Dino, explain to me the Greek word, harpazo, what it means. He says it means to snatch by force, to snatch out of danger's way. It means to look at someone and hear a sound and turn back and they're gone. But he said one of the meanings can be, if you, if, for example, if, if in modern Greek, Greek, if you are a, have a child playing in the street and you see something coming that's going to harm them, you grab them by the